Let me double check. We are live on YouTube. All right, I think we're live. We're live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jeff Hunt, and I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the Vice President of Public Policy for Colorado Christian University, where I help direct our public policy think tank, the Centennial Institute. It is the practice of the Centennial Institute at Colorado Christian University to host public lectures and dialogues on the most important issues facing our nation. Today's discussion is critical to our country. I want to encourage everyone to engage today's panel discussion via the chat features on YouTube or Facebook. I'll be reviewing questions from you there and asking our panelists to respond. Today's panel discussion is a continuation of a discussion we had about two weeks ago on the sin of racism and America's promise of equality. Today we're going to explore more solutions. In fact, the feedback from that first panel discussion was wonderful. If you missed it, Go back to our YouTube channel where you can watch it there. In the weeks since the first discussion, Congress, states, and municipalities have introduced legislation to reform policing. What's right and what's wrong with this approach? Leftist organizations are seeking to go further in defunding the police, tearing down statues, requiring reparations, and even creating autonomous zones. How does America address the challenges of bad policing and racism without dividing the nation? What are other solutions to improving access to the American dream for black Americans? Today, we're honored to welcome back community leaders, E.J. Pearson, Dr. Biff Gore, and Casper Stockholm, Stockholm for an online discussion regarding these issues. I do want to point out that Antonia Okafer cover was going to be with us. She's not feeling well. So uh, she messaged me at the very last minute and said she's not able to join us. So will you please... Make sure to be praying for Antonia. I think if we could have all the people that are watching us say a word of prayer for her health uh, and well-being, that would be wonderful. C.J. Pearson is a serial entrepreneur and civic leader who serves as the founder and president of Last Hope USA and chief executive officer of Pearson Unlimited. Every week, C.J.'s impassioned and provocative conservative commentary reaches millions of Americans online. You've got to follow him on Twitter and Instagram. In the fall, CJ will be attending the University of Alabama, where he intends to double major in business and political science. Friends, we've had some great young rising stars come uh, and stop by the Centennial Institute on their way to changing this nation. I think of folks like Charlie Kirk. I think of uh, Katie Pavlich. And I'm telling you, watch CJ Pearson. The sky's the limit for this young thinker. We're also going to hear from Casper Stockham who is a Gulf War veteran, honorably, honorably served over 14 years in the Air Force as a weapons and communications specialist. He is a business owner, trainer, and HR consultant. He is an author, speaker, and radio show host. One of his latest books is The Great Black and Millennial Awakening. He is a Christian marriage coach with his wife, Cheryl. He's also running for Congress in Colorado's 7th Congressional District. We are nonpartisan, but Casper, if you win, uh, we're going to want to see a lot of these solutions we're talking about today implemented in Congress. We're so grateful you are stepping up to try to lead our community. So thank you for being with us today, Casper. Dr. Biff Gore is a powerful soul blinging, soul blinging, soul singing blues and R&B songwriter. His rich vocals landed him a spot on season six of The Voice singing A Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke with Team Usher. His Grueling blues sound moved him on to the top eight with Team Blake. Biff Gore is the worship pastor at Highline Community Church here in Centennial, Colorado. His passion is worshiping the Lord. He is also a fellow on the Sanctity of Life at the Centennial Institute. And if we look at your background there, Biff, I, uh, I think uh, we may be seeing you in the White House someday, right? Are you coming to us live from the Oval Office? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we got a chance to talk a little bit of beforehand, and I consider these guys great friends. Uh, Antonio, we're definitely missing you. If you're watching this, uh, know that our thoughts and prayers are with you. But we were talking beforehand. 
I think there's a number of problems uh, at stake here, not just one. And uh, we've got policing issues, which uh, we're going to start with today, that I think conservatives should be concerned about. We uh, care about limited government. We don't want an over-militarized police. We do respect the police. We, we back the blue. We support them and, and the great work that they do for our communities. But where there are problems, we want to see solutions. And in Colorado, a bill was just passed, signed by the governor, uh, that, that did this, supported by many Republicans and conservatives. Uh, Senator Tim Scott uh, just introduced the Justice Act at the Senate level, did a lot of the same things this Colorado bill did. Let me here start by reading uh, kind of an overview of what the Colorado bill did and what Senator Scott talked about and uh, get your take on addressing these for improving policing in our communities. So uh, requires body cameras to be worn and every, uh, at least here in Colorado, every officer in the state with some minor exceptions like undercover officers are required to wear body cameras. Uh, it bans choke holds and carotid control holds. Uh, it uh, really charges an officer to intervene with another officer if there's a problem. In fact, it says an officer who fails to try to stop another officer from using excessive force could face a class one misdemeanor or greater charge. Uh, for officers that have been convicted of improper use of force, they're terminated. Uh, we're gonna create a database that tracks bad officers. Uh, it really removes qualified immunity with the exception for those that um, are uh, trying to act in good faith. So it keeps that good faith requirement in there, but qualified immunity basically would now allow uh, civilians to bring civil charges against officers um, and then allows for police prosecutions by the attorney general. Uh, Tim Scott, similar bill, uh, really wants to enforce on de-escalation. Now, this was at the federal level, uh, requires a duty to intervene, uh, withholds grants from police departments that are implementing chokeholds, improves hiring practices so that the police officers reflect the demographics of the community that they're policing, and then allows access to a national database uh, on disciplinary records, So, and then requires body cameras as well. Guys, what are your thoughts on uh, what's been proposed, signed into law in some cases, when it comes to uh, improving policing in America? I think um, having accountability is a great thing. And uh, some of these measures are, um, they're really common sense measures, right? You shouldn't be able to choke a man to death uh, after you've restrained them. Um, but I also do think that having body cameras also protects the, the, police, uh, the, the police officers. Um, having accountability really, and I'm speaking from the point of being a, um, a, a minister of the gospel. The Bible says that police officers in Romans 13 they bear the sword for a reason. They are minister. They are an arm of the church. Um, whether uh, our liberal friends won't agree with that, but they are an arm. They they are sent by God. They are ordained by God to bear the sword, to crack down on people doing evil, evil doers. And if you did, if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to fear. But they do need accountability. They need they need accountability in the sense that um, they need someone. They do need some oversight. I don't, I don't believe in over-policing, but I do believe that we need competent police officers. I would never live in a, I wouldn't live in a city or a country that didn't have police officers. So policing is necessary. Um, and they do need some, there, there needs to be some, um, uh, I, I want to say um, community, um, there, there needs to be some um, account, community accountability. That's, that's what I was looking for. And if you can, if I can see what the, if, if we can see what the actions are, it protects the police officer. It also pr protects the citizen as well. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. So I just want to say that when I grow up, I want to be just like CJ when I grow up. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> so I think the, I think the state uh, bill that just passed, and I believe the governor signed into law, goes way too far. Uh, it's, it has some good points, you know, body cameras are good and so forth, but it goes way too far. Um, I like Tim Scott's uh, um, suggestion. 
and it maybe can use some some uh, strength in some areas that the Democrats are talking about. But I want the federal government to be very careful not to over um, over legislate this. It needs to be constitutional. It needs to be based in the Constitution first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So I would rather them overreach at the state level because we have access to those individuals. You know, we can vote them out easier than we can someone at the federal government. So I want to make sure that that when the federal government does something. When I'm in office, I'm going to make sure that the laws that I uh, suggest and recommend and, and vote on are constitutionally based. And I believe Tim Scott's is constitutionally based. I also have my own suggestion that I put out yesterday. I put out in a press release. It's called the Citizens Empowerment Act. It is constitutionally based. It guarantees all citizens fair, equal, and transparent justice under the law and seeks to hold abusive law enforcement individuals and agencies accountable. You know, like Biff was talking about, we need to have more accountability and transparency. This uh, enhances our First Amendment rights related to law enforcement. So what I've done is I looked at the First Amendment and, and tried to apply it to a law enforcement situation. For example, you get stopped by a police, they turn in a report. Well, you as a citizen now with my Citizens Empowerment Act would also be able to turn in a report on that incident. So you could report Officer Jones or Officer Smith for some infraction. It gets seen by a third party or um, entity. And then it's also public. So it's, it's like a public, um, um, excuse me, a public database of sorts to where anyone can pull that up and see that Officer Smith has 20 complaints on, on this guy. And they're all very similar. You know, I got stopped at night and he told me to do this and do that. It was just wrong. So if we have more accountability in that uh, process, I think it would go a long way to um, solving the problem. Casper, can I, can I ask an aside question to that? Um, I know that there's federal and then there's, this, there's um, state um, bills that are being proposed and passed. Yeah. And all. The federal bill that's being proposed, um, would that have any bearing on what happens in the states because the, the state is sovereign just like the federal government is sovereign or would that only apply to federal officers and fe federal law enforcement it would mainly apply to federal law enforcement situations however the state can look at that federal law and say you know we like that we're going to implement that as well uh, okay. but yes and that, that was a point that uh, uh tim scott brought up on the floor if you watch his floor speech yesterday, which was really good. I mean, it is one of the most important speeches I think we could watch because he points out that what the Democrats are doing uh, on the House side wouldn't have the impact that Tim Scott has proposed on the, on the Senate side because it's only addressing federal law enforcement officers, right. whereas Tim Scott's pointing out we're going to withhold grants from states if right. they don't implement this. So ours actually goes further and uh, making sure that we're addressing these problems at the table that the Democrat uh, proposal on the House side doesn't address. Exactly. If we can, before I, I wanna, we jump to CJ, I wanna hear your thoughts. Uh, Tim Scott did a great video uh, on his bill. It's only two minutes. I'm gonna share my screen. We can watch it real quick awesome. and get a sense of, of what they're proposing. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And we're going to watch uh, Tim Scott. So let me make sure that the audio uh, goes through on this. I like that necktie he's wearing, by the way. I know. Did you notice that? that where did he get that? Where do you get that from? <laughs> <laughs> that tie. Uh, that tie comes from the Centennial Institute, uh, wow. and he's always been a friend of ours. We've had him speak at the Western Conservative Summit before. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share my audio. Uh, we're going to watch this here. Hey, I'm Senator Tim Scott here to talk about a very important issue, the police reform bill that I've sponsored called the Justice Act. The vast majority of police officers do a really good job keeping our community safe. At the same time, black men are two and a half times more likely than white men to be killed by the police. That number has to come down. I myself have been stopped seven times in a single year as an elected official. My only offense, driving while black. George Floyd, Walter Scott, and Breonna Taylor should not be dead. 
the Justice Act will help to ensure that that list does not grow longer. Let's take a walk through the Justice Act. In the Justice Act, we deal with the issue of de-escalation and the duty to intervene. We want more training on these very important issues. As we walk through the tragedy of George Floyd, what we saw were three officers standing there that had an opportunity to intervene. We think the more training, the more emphasis, the more lives we save. Also in this section is the important issue around chokeholds. Here's the issue. About three quarters of the departments around the country, from my understanding, have already banned chokeholds. This is important because if the majority of our departments have already eliminated it, we think we should keep moving in that direction. Improving hiring practices. Here's what we've learned through history, that people of color typically recruit other people of color. We've learned that, that women recruit more women officers. Why is that the case? We don't know. The fact that it is the case, we do know. So we target more actual trainers, more recruiters to be from diverse communities so that we're able to have departments reflect the demographic makeup of their communities. Another aspect, the second aspect of this bill, ensures that when a candidate is interviewed, the department looking to hire will have access to their prior disciplinary records. We believe that as bad apples go from one department to another, preserving those records so that someone can do a reference check to find out that history is really important. The law enforcement reporting reforms is a critical aspect of the Justice Act. Here's what we think should be reported. If an officer is involved in an incident that leads to serious bodily injury or death, we want that information reported to the FBI. I have for the last five years been talking about the importance of body cameras. This bill, the Justice Act, focuses resources to make sure that more of our departments have the body-worn cameras so that when that light comes on, the whole picture is seen. And for those who don't turn it on, there are penalties and the legislation as well. Together, we will move this country to forward and at the same time, restore confidence in the institutions of authority. May God continue to bless the United States and specifically our law enforcement communities and the communities that they serve. We lost some of the video there at the end, but you get a sense of what Tim Scott's trying to do. He's proposing solutions uh, to try to address specifically what happened to George Floyd so that that is not a regular occurrence uh, in our country. Um, CJ, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Jeff, well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. And, and, and first and foremost, I watched that video, and I think what is most interesting about it is a stark contrast between how conservatives have responded to the tragedy of George Floyd's killing as opposed to liberals. You know, liberals went to the streets, they burnt uh, Wendy's down, they burnt Home Depot's down, they burnt everything down, really. Uh, and then they said that they wanted to defund the police. They said they wanted to take police out of inner cities where people of color are already losing their lives every single day. Uh, just this past Father's Day weekend, more than 101 people were shot in the city of Chicago. Um, in the entire calendar year of 2019, only nine unarmed African-Americans were shot by police throughout that entire year. Uh, but, you know, the difference between Republicans uh, and Democrats here is that we're actually talking about real solutions that target bad officers, because we know that not all police officers are bad. We know that the majority of them are good. Um, things like body cameras, that's just common sense. It helps the community and it helps the officers. Um, things like, uh, you know, the, the reporting. There is no reason that that shouldn't already exist. It's kind of crazy that it doesn't watching that video and, and, and seeing that, you know, that doesn't already happen where like if someone is leaving a police department because they have a bad record, that the department they go to doesn't have access to that. These are common sense reforms. You know, while liberals are talking about pie in the sky ideas like defunding police, which are going to lead actually to minority communities being far more unsafe than they are safe, Republicans are talking about real ideas and solutions uh, that are going to move this issue forward. And, and, and it's so important. Uh, because 
it, it's just, it, and it speaks to so much that's going on about the authenticity that is required when we're having this conversation. You know, it's one thing to say Black Lives Matter is a totally different thing to actually show it and do it. Um, and that's exactly what this legislation is doing. I'm, I'm so proud of Senator Scott for leading the um, leading um, on this issue. And it's a shame that Democrats didn't even want to bring it to the floor. Um, it, it, it tells you a lot about them and, and, and really, if they even care about this issue at all, or if they really just want to divide uh, the American people even further than they already are on the basis of race. And, and, and I will admit they have every incentive to do so. It's the only way they can maintain power in this country. Right. Yep. Senator Scott brought that up on a floor speech yesterday. It's about 30 minutes. Uh, it's on and I recommend that you watch it. Uh, he points out that uh, they didn't get enough votes to even bring this to the floor to debate, to discuss, to amend. He went to the House Democrats and said, I'll be willing to give you 20 amendments, the maximum amount of amendments allowed onto a Senate bill. We'll add whatever you want. I'm happy to even get 70% of what we want out of this bill. We want to negotiate. We want to find ways to make this better. And the, and the Senate Democrats refused to allow this even to go to a vote or to a discussion. And what he points out is that uh, the House and Senate Democrats want this to remain a problem so that they can get elected, then, then they'll do something about that. And in the meantime, you're going to have uh, black Americans all over this country that aren't going to benefit from changes in law, from holding police accountable, because they'd rather have this be an election issue, go through all of November, then maybe they'll make it a priority, maybe not. But uh, they're not willing to address this now. Casper, you want to run for office? You want to go work in the swamp? Uh, what, what is going on here? Well, what's going on is the Democrats in the swamp, they want to put the measures in place that the state Democrats are, are, are putting in place, especially here in Colorado. They'd love to take that Colorado template and move that to the federal level. Yeah. And that totally wipes out a lot of our constitutional rights. So that is the problem. Uh, every time that the Democrats uh, uh, put measures in place or, or put laws in place, uh, our, our constitutional rights are, are being affected by that. But the challenge is we know it, you know, because we're uh, tuned and we're, you know, we're up on the Constitution. Centennial Institute has courses and we teach, the, we teach the youth that. But in the inner city, they don't know about the Constitution. They don't know what they're, what they're losing. Uh, so we need to do a better job as conservatives, as Republicans, uh, of going into the inner city and teaching the Constitution so that people actually know what they're, you know, what they're losing. Right now, they don't even feel like they're even a part of America, of the, pro of the, you know, the awesome country, of the process of, of uh, um, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. They don't even know what that means because they've been taught for generations that um, they don't have access to that unless some awesome white person gives them that power. And that's what we have to take away. We have to show them they have the power without anyone stepping up to the plate. They are Americans. We are Americans. I don't need for, uh, I'd love for your help, Jeff, but I don't need it in order to be a whole individual, right? So, so we need to teach that to our youth in the inner city. Uh, and Biff, it's so important. I, if I could go for like, or CJ. Yeah, and you know, what he just said is so important. It's about removing victimhood you know from it all you know we we can choose to live on our knees but why should we you know and, and i think the the left has this has this way of doing this we're like they, they they love promoting dependency because that is the way they erect control it's the way they maintain it it's because the more people that are dependent upon the government it, it, the, the more they're able to stay in power um you mentioned that the left is punting this issue because they wanted to be an election issue and, and i think what that speaks to is a really tough pill to swallow but a really big thing that's actually just reflective reality is that they just don't really care about black people they care about us as talking points they care about us as a means to an end to advance their political agenda but from all their actions that i've seen i just can't really make the argument they actually care about black people this legislation addresses every single issue they say exists on the front of policing in terms of having a nation a national database of having body cameras required it actually has teeth in the legislation because it's attached to grant money to these state um, and local police departments but they still opposed it because they would rather more black people die unjustly that's their argument right then give a Republican a win. They care more about 
their partisanship than innocent black men and women being alive. That's the argument they're making. And I think it's one that we need to talk about. Why do they want to see more black people die as long as they get the win, you know, legislatively? I, I think it's I think it's sick and depraved. And I think it's the worst example of hyperpartisanship that we've seen in a long, long time in this country. And when Pelosi, um, when she accused Tim Scott of that, she was literally talking about herself because that's what she will, um, you know, to CJ's point, that's what they're doing. Yeah. Let's, uh, I want to shift to the second question that I raised, uh, and Biff, uh, speak into this. Uh, the argument out there is that racism is pervasive. It is in many aspects of our community, and there needs to be a larger tearing down of the American system. We saw it with the leader of uh, Black Lives Matter on Fox News, or one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter on Fox News just recently, saying that if we don't get what we want, we're going to burn the system down. We need to topple the statues. We need to go after uh, white statues because of the pervasiveness of white supremacy in churches. Uh, does the system need to be brought down? Do we need to start afresh? Does everything need to be torn down, burned down uh, because of the pervasiveness of racism in this country? That would be a resounding no. Um, this whole Black Lives Matter movement that um, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying Black Lives Matter in the sense that all lives do matter. I think it brings attention to a, a problem that's being addressed right now. But this organization, Black Lives Matter, <clears throat> this is uh, cultural Marxism. And it is, it is a religion, it is a political affront, and it is an affront to the gospel. And I think that anything that, that attacks uh, that this organization is getting us to take out, it, getting Americans to take us as Christians to take our eyes off of the real issue. The real issue is the church needs to have a louder voice. The, the church has been the ostrich with its head in the sand for a long time. The church, if you go to most churches on Sunday morning, people would say, oh, it's the most segregated hour in America. Well, that's some churches, but that, that has to do with preference. But you right. can go to as many churches that are that, that aren't as integrated as we would like. I can point out a, a thousand other churches that are that are fully integrated, that are the reflection of the picture of reconciliation. And so this narrative about racism really is, a, is, is an eight-year-old problem. It all began, I, I wanna say, with the Obama administration. This whole systemic thing became, uh, became an issue then. We had great ministries 20 years ago, like Promise Keepers, it was out teaching, uh, bringing up the subject, talking about, about racism. I just feel like um, the, 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 the church, first and foremost, the church has allowed itself this narrative to be taught. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, this narrative has become pervasive because we are not invading our culture with the truth. And instead we are letting a minority of people, a very small minority of people with the biggest bully pit and the loudest, um, they're, they're, they, are, um, they are speaking on behalf of the black community, which I think is also a racist thing. That is racist for, for BLM, who doesn't represent me, who doesn't represent 90% of the black people in America, telling us what we should be, what we, what's good for us. It's almost like somebody's patting me on the head saying, good boy, now you do what we say. And that is, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Um, is ra racism is a sin. We've talked about that. It is. But what can we do? To, what can what should we be doing to end it? It's not a government issue. We can't legislate people to love one another. We got to tell we have to take the gospel to people. It's a heart issue. Yeah. It, we have to change you. You change people from the inside out. And then you take a guy like Jeff, you and I. Right. We go out and we say, OK, I want to learn from you. You learn from me. And then we say, hey, we have differences, and that's how God made us. We're beautiful. Uh, when I look at you, I see the handiwork of God. When you see me, you see the handiwork of God. And then we, as a, as a community of brothers and sisters, then we go out and we find somebody who's less fortunate than us, and we change the culture by saying, let's show you the love of Christ by how we deal with people who are less fortunate than us. 
that's how you change this narrative. And then people will, people will say, oh, look at those evangelicals. They'll say, look at those evangelicals, they care. This is the Black Lives Matter movement. This is the All Lives Matter movement because we're caring for people, we're, because we're treating people as humane. We're treating people because everyone Every person has the image of Christ in, on, and with them. Yeah. No, Biff's right, of course. He's, all, he's always right. I keep expecting President Trump to walk through that door any second, though, Biff. <laughs> 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 but you know what? Uh, um, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, BLM, here's the thing. If they really were concerned about all Black lives, I bet you all of us on this podcast, all of us, all the listeners, all the people watching would be on board with them, but they don't care about my black life. Okay. They don't care about conservative black lives. They don't care about the, the um, 70 something year old retired police officer that was shot in the head in Minneapolis. They don't care about those black lives. And that's the problem. If black lives matter was just as concerned about the black on black crime in the inner city, all of us would be on board with that. But they're very selective in the lives that they are, are, are focused on. And typically, it's the lives of criminals. They're not even focused on just average people, like the, you know, like the three-year-old uh, um, girl that was shot in her home. Okay, They're not focused on those lives, and that is a problem. Um, what I like to say on the campaign trail is it's lacking a spark. The community is lacking a spark. And spark is a system, a plan, access, resources, and knowledge. Any community that has a spark does well, just like the suburbs aren't having these problems. But the inner city, the Democrat controlled cities and states, they don't have a spark. They, you know, they don't have the Christian spark for sure. And, and that's a huge problem. We as Christians need to step up and be heard and seen at this particular time because the world is lacking light and we are the light. And if we're not shining it, it's not going to get shined. So that to me, is a huge part of the problem. CJ, you live uh, in the South. I believe you're in Atlanta or Georgia, somewhere near there. Um, is it time to get rid of these uh, Confederate monuments, the naming of Confederate military bases? Uh, that was a war that was over 200 years ago. Uh, yeah, time so, to get rid of this stuff? Yeah, so I'm not going to... 150 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think if we're going to talk about statues, let's talk about the history of those statues and the fact that they're all Democrats. And that it literally, every time I look at those statues, what I'm reminded of is the fact that the Democrat Party was founded upon the bedrock of racism and white supremacy in this country. They are a party and ideology that told my great grandmother that she belonged at the back of the bus. They are the party that fought an entire war over the preservation of slavery. They are an ideology that prevented black people from voting in this country. They're an ideology that prevented black people from drinking on the same water fountain as white people in this country. And I understand why they want to get rid of those statues. I would too. This is a great opportunity for them to rebrand. But I think the reality of it is that this is just more performative activism from the left. Um, taking down a statue won't end racism. Um, that's just the reality of it. You know, we can take down every racist statue in this country. We can take down every statue that depicts a racist in this country, whatever. It's not going to end racism. It is just another example of the left punting and choosing not to actually do anything that really benefits black people. Um, you know, Casper hit a great point. Uh, black Lives Matter doesn't actually really care about black people. If they did, they'd be talking about the fact that 17 million babies, black babies have been aborted since uh, Roy V. Wade. They'd be talking about black on black. Mm -hmm. They'd be talking about the fact that in countless inner cities across America and cities like Detroit, Flint, Michigan, uh, and, 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 and so many more. Ferguson, these are all cities that have been ran by Democrats for decades. But you look at the state of the Black community in each of these communities, they're in despair. What is the pattern of all of that? It's Democrat governance. And so it's, it's always so interesting to me when people, you know, or you take to the streets and they say, you know, F Donald Trump and things like that, because it's like, if you look at all these cities where all of these people, these unarmed black men are being shot and killed and all of these things, all these acts of police brutality are happening. They're happening in cities with a Democrat mayor, a Democrat police chief, and a Democrat led city council and police force. And it's just like, wow. Like how, how do we get to this point where we're blaming Republicans and conservatives for something that they haven't ever done, you know? And, and so the statues, what, whatever, you know, I'm not going to sit here and defend statues of Democrats. I, I'll, I'll let them handle their issues. But 
Um, at the end of the day, what I'm saying is that if we want to actually combat and confront uh, racism in this country, that's not going to really do much. And if we actually are going to talk about bettering the lives of black people in this country, let's talk about things like economic opportunity zones so that we can bring businesses uh, and economic investment into these inner cities that the left has long neglected. Let's talk about, uh, you know, encouraging uh, families, um, you know, within the black community. Let's bring fathers back into the home. Let's, let's talk about the importance of that. Um, let's talk about a resurgence of Christ, you know, within the black community. I think that's so important. Um, those are how, you know, we advance black lives in this country. It's not about taking down a statue. It's not about tweeting black lives. Matter. It's not about posting a caption of a black box or whatever. It's not actually doing something. Um, policy and through action. Uh, that's how we start. That's how we win. And I want to get to uh, I want to get to that because helping Black Americans achieve the American dream should be a concern of all of us. And I want to get into those questions. And CJ, you've done a great job actually modeling that. I want to talk about that in just a second. But I do want to go back to larger issues within American history that have led to uh, problems with racism. Uh, we had redlining that took place in this country. Um, should we be exploring reparations to the black community? You know, that's interesting. I just heard uh, again, this talk about reparations. The problem, Jeff, is black folks owned slaves as well during their time. And so did Indian tribes own slaves during their time. In fact, the, the Trail of Tur Tears were Indian uh, uh, tribes taking their slaves with them <laughs> to the new location. So, um, you know, where do we start having that conversation? I want to have it because most of the people that were slave owners were Democrats. So if we're going to start taking money from somebody, they're the first in line or they should be the first in line. But it just it's a it's just another way for them to um, have me and Biff and CJ and and other black conservatives uh, uh, saying, well, OK, OK, well, which line do I stand in to get my reparations? And my challenge is my grandfather was white okay so do i have to pay myself now some money or what <laughs> you, know, you know how does this all work and it's a complicated issue we need to be trying to, to empower people not try to figure out the best way to compensate people let's start empowering people let's start yeah. empowering our children so they can start living the american dream you know the two um, top rates i think i mentioned this before but the two top races of income in our nation right now are nigerians and asians and then white. So obviously we don't live in a racist country because those two would not be at the top of the, uh, of the income uh, um, level. So we need to start looking at reality, looking at the truth of the matter. Yeah. And right There's, now- I have the list here, median household incomes, you're right. Asian uh, averages quite a bit more than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, we can't see it, but yeah, you're right. Uh, Is that? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I am, I am, I am, I am, diametrically, uh, is that right? I'm diametrically opposed yeah. to reparations. I think it would be, it would harm, uh, it, would, it would do greater harm than good. Here's why. Um, my children are of, um, they are, of, they, are missed, they are mixed ethnicities, right? My, uh, my, my, my wife is, uh, is black, uh, she is uh, Japanese and she's white. And so that means my children have this, this, this great American melting pot mixed uh, heritage. What we're asking though is, we're, we're, so then that would be like saying to my children, you need to apologize for Pearl Harbor because of your Japanese heritage. They had nothing to do. Most of the people who are here, even, even those, the Bible says that we should not hold people accountable for the sins of their fathers. And that's what we do. When that th this is kind of the same mentality we have with a rape victim, where we say, "Hey, you know what you deserve? You deserve to take your child down and, and murder your kid at the abortion clinic, and that child deserves to live, not because of the, the crime of their father. Father should be punished for that. That's what we should be getting at, and not at not uh, destroying the life of a child. So reparations has, is a fallacy. So then what do you do after that? What, then then when would you then feel like you have equal standing in the United States? You have equal standing now. You're an American. We need to change the narrative. We need to stop calling ourselves black Americans and white Americans and, because our history is American history. Right. Your history is American history. 
And it's just another ploy to divide us. When are we going to say, hey, this is this is what it is. Maybe 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 we need to have more than a more than a um, um, more than a, 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 repara- a putting a, a, a fiduciary piece to this. Maybe we should have a, a forgiveness ceremony where we forgive one another for all the things that that uh, um, this uh, the, all the things that um, that need to be forgiven. Right. Slavery was a sin. And the reason why slavery in America was a sin is because you couldn't, you weren't, you're not allowed to kidnap a person according to uh, the law. And it, maybe, maybe we should have a forgiveness ceremony. We say, okay, we, we were wrong. And, and now here's, here's where we go from here because money's not going to fix the problem. Yeah. And I wouldn't take the money. I wouldn't take it. Would you take it, Casper? No, no. You know, but the problem <laughs> with forgiveness is the people that need to be forgiven are dead. So. Exactly. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, but in order to move on, we this is this is part of America. Yeah. It, I, it, I, I've forgiven. I've forgiven Jeff a long time ago. I've forgiven every white person that ever walked I, the planet a long time ago. So I'm moving amen. on, my brother. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I'll say that Dr. Biff is a better man than me. If any white liberal wants to pay me my reparations today that is watching, I will personally give you my mailing address, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, whatever you need. Happy to provide it. Right. Uh, anything, anytime. But you, but you know what you do with it, CJ? Oh. You know what you do with it. You would give it to people who are, who, are, who are downtrodden, broken, and hurt. Man, I love that you did that. I love that you did that fundraiser for those people whose businesses were burned in this foolish melee. Right. And, and that's a good that's a good segue because I, I want us to maybe perhaps think about reparations in a different way. I think a lot of us as followers of Christ, when we see a community that's suffering in any capacity, we go, we want to help them out. Uh, right now, reparations from the left is really under the idea of, of receiving some type of monetary benefit from the government. Um, but uh, when you look at our communities, uh, we're investing in a lot of different ways in inner city communities where uh, there's dozens of ministries that are down there to help kids get better education, to keep them out of uh, trouble, uh, when, to invest in businesses and to grow those communities. So in many ways, we are seeking to try to uh, pay for the problems that have resulted in these, in, in these communities suffering. Uh, Jay, Let's talk about what you did. Uh, while the left is down there burning communities, you started a fundraiser to go serve those communities uh, that are uh, there as, as a result of, of the burnings that are taking place in these cities. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely, Jeff. Uh, you know, I remember waking up one morning and watching tons of videos of America just burning one night. You know, it was it was crazy to see. And it became a lot, it, hit, it began to hit a lot closer to home when it was happening to Atlanta, which I'm, you know, two hours or so away from there. And just all of these businesses were just being looted, vandalized and burned. And they were saying that they were doing it for black people. They say they were doing it in the name of Black Lives Matter. But I was really confused. I was like, how is burning down a Wendy's going to help me? You know, how is that going to help sow the racial divide? How is that going to help bring back George Floyd or secure justice for him even? Um, but it, it, but it, it didn't. It was just a manipulation of a, of a very bad thing that had happened to, uh, to a man um, used to push their own Marxist leftist agenda. Uh, and, and I wanted to do something because I had seen all of these people posting black boxes and all these things, but not actually really doing anything that was actually going to help black people. And what these crazy people who were doing these burnings didn't realize is that they were actually burning down black businesses. They were burning down black hair salons. They were burning down black boutiques. They were burning down, you know, black uh, food places, all of these things. And they didn't even realize it. So what I did is I created this fundraiser. Uh, I started with an initial goal of just $30,000. I said, you know, if we raise $30,000, we'll be able to help, you know, a really great business rebuild better than they ever thought they ever could. And it would be a really good thing to do. We shot through that goal in just three or so hours. And after that, we were able to raise more than $160,000 in the course of just three or so days. These were conservatives donating to this fundraiser. You know, the conservatives who are apparently racist, bigots, hate black people, um, you know, are the new KKK. They were the people that were supporting this initiative to help open the black owned businesses that leftists had burned down. 
that's a crazy way to be racist in America. I, if, if that's racism these days, I, I think we need more of that racism. But, you know, it, and it's absolutely absurd. But the thing about it is, and this really speaks to the point that um, I think that uh, Beth had talked about earlier, was that it's so important, I think, for conservatives to be more evangelical in our approach um, to going into these communities that, that people on the left have long neglected. Um, you know, cities like Atlanta, you know, Birmingham's and, and the Chicago's of the world. These are some of the poorest communities, um, but they're all ran by Democrats. But a lot of people in these communities have this warped view of conservatives because that's what the media has given them the impression we are. They think we're all old white guys. They think we're all racist. They think we all are sellouts, Uncle Tom's and all of this. But I got to tell you, when I went to that boutique in Atlanta to personally hand um, the check to that uh, business owner, um, she owned a boutique in Atlanta. She was incredibly thankful. And, you know, she didn't care where the money came from, but she had seen a conservative do something for her that she would have probably never thought that we would do, you know? And I think that's like the first step to changing minds. Like people hate what they don't know or what they don't understand. And the more we actually go out, show people who we are, then I think they'll believe us. And, and I think that that's the first step to changing hearts and minds. Wow. I mean, CJ, I that's really powerful. Biff, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, CJ. That was, I, that was incredible, man. You brought a tear to my eye when I saw that. Uh, I thought it was wonderful. The, the other thing we need to, I mean, if we're talking about um, empowering people in inner city communities, how do we get the message out that the, the road to poverty is not having a man in the home? If you want to be, a, and I learned that from Larry Elder, who, 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 uh, who talked about that on your show. I was listening to Dr. Um, 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 Dr. Dr. John McGough. I had a forum at his church. Casper, you've talked about this. I mean, this is no hidden secret. We right. need men to step up. Absentee fathers, man. Um, God designed the family. And this whole BLM movement, if you go to their website, I encourage you to go to their website. See what they're about. They are about destroying the, uh, the family. They are about destroying the image that God, the, uh, the design that God has on, on, um, on humanity. And the first thing that the liberals did and even Malcolm X talked about this. He said the worst enemy to the black man in the black community is the liberal is the is is the is the liberal agenda. Yeah. The first thing they did is they took the man out of the home. Now, how do we get the man back into the home? We got to figure out how to get the man back into church as well, because once, like I said, it all begins right here. That's a heart issue. Yeah. Once you get the heart right, everything else will come into 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 proper perspective. But we got to work on men, our men. We got to work on these guys. The men are trifling. The men get, in the community yeah. are lacking, and we have got to pit, put. We got to pull. We got to reach back and pull them up. How do we do it? Yeah. If we get the black men back in the back in church, then they will automatically be back into the home. Amen. They will, they'll get their heart right, and they'll get busy uh, working or whatever. Because there's plenty of opportunities in America. That's that's really been our problem our problem has been it's easier to sit at home and collect the check now than it is to actually go to work and that is a fault of our federal government and and the people uh passing these laws you know that that first stimulus check set us up for big time failure paying someone six hundred dollars addition uh to their unemployment a week that was a guaranteed uh, uh um set up for disaster right there. Why would I want to go back to work and earn $1,200 a month less? No, what, no, oh, $2,400 $2, less than staying at home and just collecting the money, right? So that's supposed to, that's supposed to end in July. So you're going to see a lot of, uh, um, you're going to see the economy spike up again with people going back to work because, because that, um, the government money is running out. Unless the Democrats extend it. <laughs> Unless, well, Trump has to sign it, though, so we got to make sure that doesn't happen. Right. Here, here's what I've kind of learned from you all today. I've learned watching what Tim Scott's treated, his bill, the plan. Um, we've got serious problems that we've got to address. And I, I, I'm not sure we have done a good enough job as conservatives as people of faith of really addressing these problems. Let me just 
let's just walk through them. Out of wedlock births. So these are babies that are born without mom and dad being married. In a black community, 69.4%. Right. Uh, America's average on that, 40.1%. In prison, prison population in America, 33% of those in prison are black. They make up only 12% of the population. We can thank the Democrats for that as well. The yeah. 1994 crime bill. Uh, may- graduation rates in America, 79% uh, versus 89%. If you're white, average 85%. The black community is not graduating at the same rate that uh, the white and, and average Americans are. Unemployment, 16.8% versus 12.4% if you're white. It's more likely to be unemployed if you're black. And then household median income, I mean, if you're an Asian American, 81%. If you're Black American, 40, or sorry, $81,000. If you're Black American, $40,000. Half, half, half of what Asian Americans on average make in this country. There are problems uh, within the Black community that these are our brothers and sisters that we've right. got to address. And if we're expecting the government to come do it, if you're expecting the government to help on even police form, we're, it's not there. It's right. purely partisan politics that's taking right. place there. Yeah. We've got to, and I think Biff, Casper, CJ, you have done this. You've not only said it, you've done it. It's up to us to, to serve these communities like CJ did. He went down there, raised money, handed them a check uh, himself. Uh, Biff talking about fathering and mentorship and getting people back into church uh if the the left is going to go the direction of reparations they're going to go the direction of government funding government solutions it's not working they've been in charge in these cities for 40 years it's not working it is up to us using the power of civil society uh like cj did uh using uh churches using nonprofits using brotherly, just simple brotherly and sisterly love to invest in these communities. We're going to continue to have these problems until we as conservatives step up and solve it ourselves by serving these communities ourselves and doing the best we can to, and to help them achieve the American dream that we want them to achieve. Right, right. When you look at the, um, just the education system, for example, Jeff, the, edu- the, right. the recently – they wanted to defund the police in Denver, in, in the Denver um, public school system. The reason why is because the police in the school system in Denver or in the in Denver public school system, they're looked at as the enemy. They're looked at as someone that's going to arrest my young uh, um, um, child that's in school that's misbehaving. In the suburbs, we love the police in the suburbs. We want as many resource officers at our schools as possible because we know they're going to protect our children so it's a mindset mm-hmm. that's the challenge the mindset in the inner city is police are 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 the enemy they're bad they're going to uh, shoot our youth on on site kind of thing um so we have to change that relationship between the police and the folks in the inner city and and show them that there's a better way the suburbs don't have any of the uh, of the problems that's going on right now in the inner city, especially in the school system, and the graduation rate, the completion rate in school, the continuation rate in school in the suburbs is far, far better than it is in the inner city, to where it's what forty or fifty percent failure rate or more. Well, and I think one of the ways that we're seeing us go around the government problems that have that have invest have infected these cities is things like school choice, right? Charter schools. So we're down there going, we want to help your children achieve the greatest possibilities they can. We're going to, the union schools, government run schools, they're, they're really, really bad in many, many circumstances. We could do a whole event on school choice, but, um, again, we're trying to provide those opportunities. We can't rely upon the government to do that. Uh, they're going to continue these bad systems that exist, but there's nothing that's stopping us, guys. That's what I'm trying to say. There's nothing stopping CJ from doing what he did. He went down there and actually helped a business. We can do that. 
can. That's right. CJ, what else do we need to be doing? You know, I think I think it's about going into these communities. That's a that's a big thing. There, it, it's it's so weird to think about, but there are so many people in these inner cities that have never met a conservative before. You know, that their idea of what a conservative is is fully defined by what someone on social media says or what someone on the news says, and we know what they say about us. Um, and and but it's up to us to go out and change the mind and change those minds. I think the way that we should approach, you know conservative solutions and whatnot is that it has to really be treated as if we're spreading the gospel in a way that we have to go and we have to talk to people um that you know we i think we spend a lot of time preaching to the choir but it's time for us to go um reach people that may have not been reached before and that starts with just being seen being present um and going places we haven't gone before um you know cities like flint michigan the way people talked about that, um, they you would have thought it was a city that was ran by Republicans, you know, and, and all these, uh, you know, uh, minority um, inhabitants were just given this terrible water and they were dying. You look in Flint, Michigan, it's been ran by Democrats for decades. And it's absolutely crazy because you would not know that unless you looked into Flint, Michigan, the way people were talking about it, you know. And so I think it's so important for us to just show to these people in these cities that liberal policies have so clearly failed, this is the alternative that there even is an alternative because we think, you know, it's so present, but a lot of people just don't know, you know? So like, this is an alternative. Here's what we can do for you. Here's the difference between us and them. Let's work for you. Let us serve you. Uh, and, and, you know, we're not about dependency. We're about putting you in a position where you can walk on your own because I, I think Ben Carson said this, uh, poor people have uh, pride too. They have dignity too. People just don't want to be dependent. They don't want to just, you know, they're uh, sure there are some people who just are finally getting a food stamp check every single month, but the bulk, like majority of people, they want to be in a position to provide on their own. It's a sense of pride thing for them. Uh, and I think that we need to go out and say, like, we want to put you in a position for that to be the case, for that to happen for you and your family. You know, Jeff, there's one quick thing I want to say to this, and so I know we're getting close to time to, to end, but the relationship that the, the conservatives and Republicans have with the community has been broken. It's been severed for a long time. That relationship needs to be built back. And the quickest way to build that relationship back are black conservatives. Because we can go in, I can go to the NAACP meeting. Now they might not like what I have to say, but they don't run me out of there. So empowering black conservatives will help mend that relationship. And then we can go and deliver the message that she CJ is so um, awesome at delivering, Biff, myself, and others. Biff, closing words, my friend. I agree with you. We, just like I, I began, I, t I talked about this narrative of the church just really resting on its laurels with the, with the uh, you know, with the ostrich with our head in the sand. It's the same thing. We need to be taking this message out. We need to be taking the message of the gospel. That's how you change the heart. But we also need to run for office. CJ, you need to be running for office, man. Can we're, we're you don't have a vote yet. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how. That's, one that's more how, month. One more month. <laughs> that's how we take back the the um, we 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 create the narrative, right? And we encourage our kids to go to Christian universities, like you know, like CCU, because you're going to go there and you're going to get an education. You're not going to get an agenda. It's a Christian education, and we need to have a Christian worldview. We need to be raising our kids because. We're just passing through this world. We're Americans, but we're Christians. We're, we're citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And we need to keep that mindset. And we need to be thinking about our children. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to stand before, we're going to stand before God one day. And he's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? And we're going to be held responsible for that. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I think what we've learned today, and, and gentlemen, I want to thank you. Antonia, we missed you. Uh, and your voice here, but uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for your wisdom and guidance here, and more so for the work that you're doing in the communities to try to uh, some of these disparities that we're seeing. Um, I don't think anybody wants to see these, and uh, we've got to work to change these and to address them, uh, because these are our brothers and sisters, um, and when we see parts of America that are suffering, we've got to address that, but we're also working to address the, uh, the policing problems. Uh, Tim Scott brought that up. We've had bills here in Colorado that had Republican support, uh, and we're going to 
uh, I'm going to lead an event next week to kind of go through this with uh, George Brockler and Patrick Neville. But um, there are changes that conservatives want to see at the policing level. Uh, we back the blue, we support them, but at the same time, it's, we want to hold people accountable and we want transparency. Right. And so conservatives, as we saw with Tim Scott, are trying to make that happen. Uh, we're trying to improve our community, but I think at the end of the day, what I've learned from CJ, what I've learned from Biff, and what I've learned from Casper is that uh, this is up to us. If we want to see change, we can't just rely upon failed government structures that have been in place for 40 years that aren't making any difference. Uh, in fact, some of these are getting worse. Some of these numbers are getting worse. So uh, you can be involved in a mentorship program. You can do ministry. You can uh, take the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to communities that are suffering. Uh, we can do the work ourselves. Uh, let's not just rely upon the government. Let's, as Christians, care about our brothers and sisters and do what we can to support them, just like CJ, Biff, and Casper are doing. All right. With that, any closing words, guys? Anything that I missed? <laughs> you covered it all, Jeff. Thank you for this forum. This is a good forum. You know, we're sharing it on Facebook and other social media platforms. As long as we continue to get this word out, it's going to be okay. Well, Casper, what I love about you, you've been saying this for years. Uh, we've been down at Juneteenth. I was looking at posts. I've, we've been down Juneteenth since 2012 with <laughs> Casper and Derek Wilburn and Rocky Mountain Black Conservatives and the Republican Party back when I was part of them. Uh, but uh, we were down there and now everyone's calling for Juneteenth to be a national holiday. And I'm saying, we've been doing that for 10 years now. <laughs> um, but uh, grateful for you all. Thank you for your leadership, your guidance. Uh, we've got work to do. Um, for those of you that are interested, I, I do want to say this, that this is, uh, this is a great time to pursue that degree at Colorado Christian University that you've always been looking for. Um, I know many of us are in that interesting part of life where things have changed as a result of COVID-19. But if you want to be around thinkers like this, Biff Gore is a fellow with us at Centennial Institute. Uh, you want to have these conversations in your classroom. Uh, you want to explore these issues in a way that's not agenda driven. Uh, Colorado Christian University is the place to do that over 80 degree programs. So check it out, ccu.edu. We'd love to have you join our family at CCU. Um, with that, we've got some upcoming events. You'll see some more discussions. As I mentioned, we wanna to continue to explore these and be a resource for people to uh, understand and learn about these issues. So be sure to check us out and uh, check out our YouTube channel uh, for videos just like this. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you everybody. Biff, I don't know if you have your guitar and wanna play us out like you did last time. But yeah. uh, you're welcome to. <laughs> All right. I got you, brother. We lost you on the video. Oh, I'll be right back. I, I'll, I'll be right there. Uh, <laughs> and I had that guitar handy at a moment's notice. Not, a, not all the time you get someone from The Voice to be able to, in the <laughs> White House, in the Oval Office, playing us <laughs> out. All right, Biff, take us home, my friend. This is what we need. I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, just like the river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know change's gonna come oh yes it will yes it will oh, oh yes it will yes it will <laughs> love you guys thank you all so much Take care, god bless you god bless, god bless.